This is Duke University. No disease has killed more people in all of human history than tuberculosis, a frighteningly contagious disease, TB infected in the late 19th century, more than 80%, yes, 80% of all Americans before their 20th birthday. And we didn't even get the worst of it. Infection rates were closer to 100% throughout Europe and elsewhere around the world, wherever people gathered in close quarters. Most of these infections were latent or asymptomatic, but they could activate at any time, at which point the disease would trigger a violent immune response that literally consumes the body from within. As far back as 460 BC, Hippocrates identified tuberculosis as the most widespread disease of his time. Far from prescribing treatment, however, the namesake of the Hippocratic Oath warned fellow doctors not to visit TB patients in the late stages of their disease, lest these doctors' professional reputations be damaged upon their patient's likely death. You see, until the 1940s, there was no effective treatment for TB. Indeed, society's only answer to the TB scourge was to weed out active TB sufferers from their midst, sending them off to so-called tuberculosis sanatoria where they would be given as much fresh air as possible, but remain bedbound until their death or return to latency. All of us, I'm sure, would rather not think about the horror that diseases like tuberculosis wrought on countless previous generations. But we have to remember, because there's a chance those dark days may return. If the drugs that treat TB lose their effectiveness due to antibiotic resistance, there will be little that we can do to stop it from spreading once again, even in wealthy nations like the United States. Moreover, the threat of antibiotic resistance isn't limited to tuberculosis. Concerns over drug resistance have arisen in recent years for many diseases, everything from gonorrhea to hospital-acquired strains of staph, E. coli, and salmonella. Fortunately, if we take this threat seriously and muster our intelligence and will to fight back against drug-resistant disease, we can conquer this threat. That's the purpose of this video, to point the way to a better future where all generations, not just our own, remain free from the danger of antibiotic resistance. Let me begin by telling you a bit about myself. My name is David McAdams. I'm an economics professor at Duke University in the Fuqua School of Business. Now you may wonder, what's an economist and a business school professor doing talking about antibiotic resistance? Well, resistance arises from games that bacteria play, and I am a game theorist. Usually I think about more business-related games, like games that buyers play with sellers or that firms play with customers. But recently I've been thinking about different sorts of games, including the games bacteria play that influence resistance. As a game theorist who is not a medical doctor, not a medical researcher, I think I still potentially bring something to the table, slightly different perspective, that I hope can add to the broader conversation in the medical and public policy community on how best to tackle resistance. At Fuqua, I teach an MBA elective called Game Theory for Strategic Advantage. This is a course not on the science or theory of game theory, but on the art of applying game theory in practice to gain an advantage in real-world strategic settings. My message in this course is that game theory, combined with what I call game awareness, a true understanding of the game at hand, can help us to make headway on just about any strategic challenge. And few strategic challenges are more pressing or more important at this moment than the rise of antibiotic resistance.
1943 was a banner year for modern medicine, as the first effective drug treatment for TB, called streptomycin, was discovered. However, resistance to this drug was detected just a few years later, meaning that some patients had disease that could not be effectively treated with streptomycin. Several additional drugs have been developed over the years to fight TB, but the story has been much the same. Though these drugs remain effective for many, resistance has developed to all of them in at least some patients. Indeed, for the first time in 2012, so-called totally resistant strains were reported in India. These are strains of TB that are resistant not only to the most effective first-line drugs, such as streptomycin, isoniazid, and rifampin, but also to the most effective second-line drugs. Such tough-to-treat TB strains are currently far from American shores, but like any disease, it can spread. And when it does, what can we do to stop it? Some take a fatalistic view of this problem, including Margaret Chan, the Director General of the World Health Organization, who even declared an end to modern medicine as we know it. She said, quote, Some experts say we are moving back to the pre-antibiotic era. No, this will be a post-antibiotic era. A post-antibiotic era means, in effect, an end to modern medicine as we know it. Things as common as strep throat or a child's scratch knee could once again kill. Fortunately, the post-antibiotic era that Dr. Chan seems to view as an inevitability is still only a possibility. There are things we can do not only to slow the rise of resistance, but to reverse it. Indeed, as I write in my book, Game Changer, quote, many are resigned to the inevitability of antibiotic resistance. But there is hope. Recent advances in genetic testing have created new strategic options that hold the potential to reverse antibiotic resistance and in doing so to tame bacterial disease forever. The central message of Game Changer is the same as that of my MBA elective, that game theory can help one address nearly any strategic challenge with in-depth applications called the Game Changer files on a wide variety of pressing and important strategic challenges. Everything from business problems, such as whether internet competition will lead to low prices, and how to design an online exchange that engenders trust, to public policy problems such as how to tackle emergency department overcrowding. We could have a fascinating conversation about any of these topics, but I've chosen to focus on the most momentous, antibiotic resistance. The rest of this video provides more background information on game theory, antibiotic resistance, and how molecular diagnostics changes the game by creating new strategic options that may hold the potential to reverse the rise of antibiotic resistance. Let me begin with a bit of background on game theory. A game is any situation in which two or more parties, called players, each make a choice, where players' choices impact one another's well-being. In our own lives, then, we play games all the time, with friends and loved ones, as well as with competitors and adversaries. Perhaps the most famous game is the so-called Prisoner's Dilemma. The story of this game is that two criminals have been pinned with a relatively minor charge that could land them in prison for several years, but committed a far worse crime that could potentially send them to jail for life. How long each prisoner actually spends in jail, however, depends on who, if anyone, confesses to the more serious crime. In particular, if neither prisoner confesses, both go to jail for five years. If both confess, both go to jail for 10 years. If only one confesses, that prisoner is immediately set free, while the other, the one who did not confess, is sent to jail for life. Both prisoners are better off when no one confesses than when both confess, but each individually has an incentive to confess to decrease his own sentence. To see the point, put yourself in prisoner one's shoes for a moment. If you expect prisoner two to confess, you have a strong incentive to confess as well, to avoid spending your entire life behind bars. But what if you expect prisoner two not to confess? In that case, you still prefer to confess, albeit now to avoid prison altogether. Since you prefer to confess no matter what you believe prisoner two is going to do, confessing is what game theorists call a dominant strategy, 
the choice seems clear. You should confess. Of course, this logic also applies to prisoner two, who has an incentive to confess no matter what you do as prisoner one. However, if both prisoners confess, both are worse off than if no one had said a word, each spending 10 years behind bars instead of five. The prisoner's dilemma might seem to have nothing to do with medicine, but interestingly, doctors play a similar game when deciding what drugs to prescribe their patients. Consider the problem that pediatricians face when they see children with ear infections. The American Academy of Pediatrics has long recommended observation rather than antibiotics for all but the most severe ear infections, recognizing that most ear infections clear on their own after about three days, with or without antibiotics. Many ear infections are caused by viruses against which available antibiotics have no effect. And exposing a child to antibiotics has other downsides, including greater risk that the child will later develop antibiotic-resistant disease. Yet most pediatricians don't heed this advice. They prescribe antibiotics. Why? A big part of the reason, undoubtedly, is parents. Most parents don't appreciate the downsides of antibiotic treatment, and they demand it for their children. This puts pediatricians in a tough spot, as refusing to prescribe antibiotics may lead parents to move their kids to other practices where antibiotics are more freely prescribed. However, as all pediatricians freely prescribe antibiotics, all are worse off as kids become more likely to develop antibiotic-resistant disease. Do you see the connection yet with the prisoner's dilemma? In that game, each prisoner felt compelled to confess to minimize his own jail time, but in doing so, wound up spending even more time behind bars. Here, each pediatrician feels compelled to prescribe antibiotics to avoid losing patients, but in doing so, fosters the rise of antibiotic resistance. It's easy to see how resistance to antibiotics tends to arise over time. As more and more drugs are prescribed to kill disease-causing bacteria, the strains of the disease that are most resistant to these drugs will tend to be the ones that survive, then multiply and take over the bacterial population, leaving us with disease that is more and more difficult to treat. Fortunately for us, there's a loophole in this logic, an implicit assumption without which drug treatment doesn't have to create the conditions for rising resistance. In particular, what if doctors could detect which patients have resistant disease before prescribing antibiotics? Those with resistant disease could then be given more powerful drugs or be put in isolation so that drug resistant strains could actually be controlled even more effectively than drug susceptible strains. If so, we would expect susceptible strains to be the ones that are most likely to survive, leaving the remaining disease easily treatable and hence less harmful for people. So the essential strategic question to ask here is, can we diagnose the drugs that will be most effective at treating a patient's disease as quickly as we can diagnose the disease itself? As recently as a few years ago, before molecular diagnosis became practical, the process of testing for drug resistance took days and even weeks, too long for doctors to wait in most cases. But now, with molecular diagnostics, it's possible, at least in principle, to read a disease's genetic code, if you will, and determine exactly how best to treat it. The promise of this technology was hailed as far back as 2002 by Dr. Beverly Rogers, Chief of Pathology at the Children's Medical Center in Dallas. As she noted, the rapid diagnosis of childhood meningitis, sepsis, or even antibiotic resistance will soon be available in real time. There is great potential to identify infections faster, treat patients better, and save patient admissions to the hospital, resulting in cost savings to the healthcare system. She was talking about Cepheid's gene expert system, which at the time was just poised to enter the market thanks to a US Army contract to detect anthrax. The magic behind the gene expert is a Nobel Prize winning process known as polymerase chain reaction, which allows the gene expert to identify if pre-specified strands of DNA are present in a biological sample. What this means is that samples can be placed directly into the machine, which can then tell you in about an hour what disease the patient has 
and whether that disease is drug resistant. In the United States, the first big application of the Gene Expert was MRSA, a nasty hospital acquired staph infection resistant to the drug methicillin. More recently, the Gene Expert has made news with its tuberculosis test, which identifies whether a patient has TB and whether their disease is resistant to the drug rifampin. This TB application alone has led to the deployment of the Gene Expert in dozens of developing countries and spurred public health authorities, together with the Gates Foundation, to subsidize molecular TB diagnosis to the point that it now costs less than $10 to diagnose TB quickly and accurately. As Cepheid touts on its website, the Gene Expert system returns most test results in about an hour, including sample prep. With the Gene Expert technology, labs no longer need rows of equipment and extensively trained staff to access molecular testing. To briefly summarize all this, molecular diagnosis can make it possible to determine which drugs are most effective to treat any given patient in a matter of hours at a cost as low as $10 per test in some cases. Once doctors can tell which patients are infected by drug-resistant disease, they can treat these patients with different drugs or isolate them from others or take still further steps to limit the transmissibility of their disease. This puts resistant bacteria at a disadvantage relative to their competition, bacteria that are susceptible to drug treatment, leaving only these easily treated susceptible bacteria for mankind to contend with. What's the ultimate message? Although we may never be able to rid ourselves of bacterial disease, we can potentially rid ourselves of drug resistance. Taking such steps now to reverse the rising tide of drug resistant bacteria would be a wonderful gift to leave future generations, don't you think? A world where people might still get sick with diseases like tuberculosis, but in which effective treatment is always available for all.